So what are we studying? Eschatology, the end of all things. And last time we left off, I was looking at some of the warnings that are given in the New Testament relative to the fact that believers should be ready and prepared for the Lord's coming, that there will be a multitude of signs that we should look for, indicating the Lord's soon return, and that we need to make sure that our hearts, our lives are lined up with his will. Hmm? Uh, I want to talk about current events for a few minutes, because what's happening in our world today should make every one of us more than ever concerned about drawing close to him than ever before. Now, where did Vladimir Putin go this week? Iran. Iran. He went to Iran. He went to Iran and he had a conference with the leader of Turkey and the leader of Iran. And, and what were they discussing? Syria. Syria. What agreements did they come away with? Do you know that? No? How about a $40 billion gas agreement? Now, Russia, interestingly, is uh, extorting who with their gas? Germany. Europe. Germany. Europe, and particularly Germany. You know that, that they've cut off the gas supply to Europe for the last nine days, I guess it is. Uh, supposedly, there's a turbine that's being reworked, you know, a uh, gas turbine that, that helps feed that pipeline. Uh, but Vladimir said uh, he's, he's sending mixed messages. But basically, what he said just a few days ago, he's going to cut off all gas to Europe. And interestingly enough, he goes down to Iran and, and cuts a $40 billion gas deal. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. hmm? Isn't Iran supplying Russia with some drones or some military Yes, they're supplying Russia with military drones. And we know that Russia, Iran, Turkey are all comprised of the principal players in the Gog Magog invasion. We studied that a few weeks ago, didn't we? So we see that coming together. Now, <clears throat> something happened that pr is provoking the Chinese. And they said, this is a violation against China's one China policy. And if this should happen, we're going to take drastic action. What am I talking about? Specifically, the last time a Speaker of the House visited Taiwan was in 1997. Who was that? Newt, Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich visited Taiwan, and, and that was in violation of, of China's one China policy. But China wasn't as strong, as belligerent as they are today. Now, who wants to go visit Taiwan? Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. Now, listen, they're just, they're just, they love taking a stick and poking it into the bear's eye, you know, or the dragon's eye. Right? Because that, that's precisely what they've done here. You need to understand geopolitically what's really taking place. Uh, and it's to their benefit in what they're attempting to achieve globally that they create these chaoses, this, this disorder among the order that's there in the globe today. Uh, so China said if she goes to Taiwan, they're going to consider that a provocation against the one China policy, and they're going to take action. And they may even, in fact, take military action against Taiwan. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? What's happened since we put the sanctions in against Russia with the ruble? It skyrocketed. Russia's worth more now than when we put the sanctions in place. The ruble is stronger than the dollar. The dollar has become weakened. The ruble has become stronger. Who they're selling the oil to? India, China, right? And, and the oil that they're selling to India, what's India doing with some of it? Selling it back to us at a premium price. They're getting, <laughs> they're getting the oil purchased from, from uh, Russia at a discount, and then they're just transporting it to us and selling it us, to us at a premium price. Aren't we a pack of fools? Mm -hmm. Hmm. But we ship more hmm. I'm sorry? We just shipped a billion barrels to China. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, you would think that these people are out of their mind. How could anybody be so stupid? No, no, no. There's as wise as a serpent and as harmless as one. I mean, as harmful as one. Excuse me. They're as wise as a serpent, but they're as harmless as one as well. Now, here's what I want you to take a look at. 
when you step back and you look at the world situation, the global situation in the West, particularly, Europe is having a terrible time. Terrible time with inflation, right? Uh, they spent more money. They produce money like it's coming out of the trees. It grows on trees. And they've caused the record inflation that they're having. Now they're having an energy crisis. And they're having shortages everywhere. Supply chain is breaking down. OK? Interesting enough, same things happen in Australia. Hmm. France. Trudeau in Canada, what's the bad news he got this week? Nobody likes him. Nobody likes Biden. Nobody likes Trudeau. Nobody likes the leader of France. Nobody seems to like any of these leaders of the West. They're all, their poll numbers are all in the basement, yet every single one of them have the same strategy. Every single one of them, record inflation, shortages, supply chain problems, spending money like it's water. Why? Now, wait a minute. If it was just Joe Biden, OK. Because this man's a simpleton. But when you put all of this together, what's really happening? Why is this happening? There's a new world order. Now, we know the Bible says that there's coming a time when there'll be a one world order, right? A one world religious system. And oh, by the way, who's the god of this new world order? The government. Satan. Satan is behind it all. But it's the government becomes a god. In these totalitarian societies, the government is everything, right? Right. So you have a one world religious system, one world governmental system, one world health system, one world uh, economic system. And, and the Bible said that that's what's going to take place at the very end. Now, who would be the model for the West of what they're really trying to accomplish in, in their global control? They have to first control their, their, their citizenry and their nation. And then they want control completely over their federation of nations. Who would be the example for them? Who? China. Listen to me. You've got to understand, their objective is precisely what China is doing today to their country. But they don't want the Chinese to control the world. They want to control the world. Who are they? These elitists in the United States and in Europe. Now, how and in what way, what are the number of uh, ways in which China is controlling their population? Well, then the one-child policy is causing them a problem. They, they don't have enough workers, and they don't have enough women to make babies. That's become a serious problem, but that's not what I'm referring to. There's, there's certain things that they put in place to help them take control of the society. Social credit score. Now, everybody gets a credit score. That's coming here soon as well, right? They watch their social media platforms, and, and based upon how well they're cooperating in being a good citizen of the state, they get a score. Based upon that score determines the, your ability to travel, your financial status, et cetera, et cetera. Be, before that score even comes out, in order to be able to score these people, everyone is under 100% what? Surveillance. surveillance. China is the most, chi the people of China are the most surveillance people or, or uh, surveilled. surveilled people in the world. Every single Chinese citizen is under surveillance. They know where everyone is at all times, right? Stop lights, they have cameras. They can track you. Face recognition, everything. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Now, that, that's why the Chinese, and particularly the underground church, was so happy when they wore masks. <laughs> harder, to, harder to identify them, OK? But, but they have this surveillance issue, right? Now, what else did they do to make sure they can control the population that isn't true here yet, but our government is really pushing for it? We're under more surveillance than you realize. You know, keep your Bluetooth off when you're not using it, right? But what, what, uh, what is it that they've done? The Chinese have been successful in doing that we haven't done yet here, but we're going to. Disarm. They're going to disarm. They disarm the citizenry. There's no, there's no way the Chinese people could rise up against the Chinese military. Can they? Tenement Square, remember Tenement Square? One man before the tank? Did the people win? No. No. It was crushed. It was crushed. They just didn't run over that guy. They might as well have. It would have been an example of what they were going to do. And they crushed that rebellion, right? So they're under surveillance. They disarmed them. Now, if you don't cooperate with the state, what do they do? What did, what did Trudeau do to the truckers in Canada? He stole their money. He stole their money, froze their bank accounts, and, and, and then they, uh, these GoFundMe programs and the social media, they cut them all off, didn't they? Big tech cooperated with them. They crippled those people. Now, that's what, exactly what China does to its citizenry when it wants to, if you get out of line, 
you're, you're toast. And you're burnt on both sides. <laughs> right? So you have the surveillance, right? You have, you have the financial punishment that they can give you. They're disarmed, okay? And, and then they have uh, the uh, loss of national identity, really. That's what, not so much China, but what they'd like to do in the West is, is kind of melt us all together, the global community. They don't like the fact that the United States was so nationalistic under Trump and our patriotism. Hmm? All of the, now listen, all of this is taking place because it's all orchestrated. We understand that the chief conspirator is Satan. 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 It's Satan, wanting to control. Now, the Pastor David and I were talking about this this afternoon a little bit. And uh, you, you said, oh, now that makes sense. What makes sense? Remember you said that to me? Mm -hmm. Now it makes sense why the kings of the east will cross the Euphrates River with an army of 200 million and come against the Europeans or the West in the plains of Esalen and Megiddo. Why? Because of global control. Now, the West, the elitists in the West want global control. The Chinese want global control. They're both trying to accomplish it the same way, but they're in competition with each other. That's what's really going to bring about the war of Armageddon. Does that make sense? So don't think that Joe Biden's in control and that he's just being a silly fool, okay? The same people, the same very small group of people that are controlling everything in the West are controlling what's happening here in our country. But the question we have to ask is, okay, Lord, why are you allowing it? And what should our response be? Sorry? God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty my sanity. Now, Pastor David gave you a message on Sunday, and I thought it was a very, very good, encouraging message on how we could prepare our hearts and our minds for what's coming. Why, why would that have been? What did Pastor David say that would in indicate that we would be encouraged and prepared for this coming, coming time of trouble? <clears throat> You gave a message, Sunday, didn't you? You remember what I said? You know, it's, you know I, I get a little frustrated when they don't remember what I said. But when I don't remember. <laughs> 40 days in the wilderness. 40 days. Food deprivation, right? He got to the point where if he didn't eat now, he was going to die, right? And then the devil comes and he tempts him, right? Now, now basically, uh, underlying in, the, in David's message, he was saying, you know, what, what, what should our reaction be if we suffer the loss of most of the things that we take for granted today? My wife was looking for it. I was, I was looking for it, a particular Tylenol for him in the shelves. And I, I was just amazed. I went and started. How many of the shelves were empty? I said, you know, we're going to have to get used to living with the fact that we're not going to be able to get everything that we're used to getting, that we take for granted. But what, what are you going to do with that? Now, remember, you made the comparison. You know, should we tempt the Lord our God? Should we go to, uh, what was that place? In the wilderness wandering? Exodus? What is it? Masa. Masa. Other name for Masa? Meribah. Meribah. Right? Right? Tempting, tempting the Lord their God, or contention with the Lord their God, saying, if you love me, this wouldn't happen. Now, wait a minute. Does God prove his love for us by the abundance of prosperity that we enjoy? No. How has God proved his love for us? At the cross. If you ever, 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 and you will, doubt God's love for you, when we're going to suffer some dark times, I hope it doesn't get too dark. I keep hearing this song. See you in September. <laughs> Face the trumpets. <laughs> but if in fact, now listen to me, if in fact we begin to suffer the loss of those things that, you know, we would hold dear now, that's not the measure of God's love for us. Or he's unloving us, punishing us. No. God's love for us was proven at Calvary. And as he exposed the truth of his love, the grace and the mercy that's given to us through the cross, we can bask in the sunshine of that love even in the darkest, darkest, darkest times of our life. Okay. And 
we have a message that we can share with the world. I was at a uh, big old Dodge this morning, had to have some service done. And this fella came in into the waiting area, and he said, good morning. And I said, good morning. He said, how's your day? I said, pretty good. He said, well, is it pretty or is it good? I said, OK, here we go. <laughs> he was a Vietnam vet, and he uh, lost a leg. He was shot five times. And uh, all of his unit were killed. He had to play dead uh, for a number of hours. Uh, another comrade of his was playing dead. When the Viet Cong Special Forces came, they recognized his comrade was still alive, and they blew his brains out right next to him. And there's been a, a book written he, he, about his life and uh, what he had gone through. And uh, amazing to me, I said, well, how did, how did your faith play into what you've gone through and how you negotiated it successfully? You know, he said, well, I'm not sure. I read the Bible every day, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. What do, what do you mean you're not sure? He said, well, you know, all these Christians I meet, they're all hypocrites. hypocrites. I said, well, you're exactly right. Most of them are. But don't let that interfere with you coming to know who the real Jesus is. I said, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about spirituality. And I said, my friend's name was John. You know, I said, you know what your name means? No, I don't know what my name means. Gracious. Gracious. I said, John, God's been gracious to you. He preserved you. He's got a purpose for that. And at the very least, he wants you to get to know him even more now. And now, particularly in this dark hour, you know. He said, well, several of his friends at the hospital, when they were going through their psychological and emotional therapy, African-American, uh, they would ask the question, what's the purpose for this war? Several of them said to eliminate the black population in America. Can you imagine? Why? Because there was an unhealthy percentage of African-American young men who died in Vietnam. <coughs> hmm. Do you see the left stopped all of the uh, ballets now? They would stop all ballet performances. You know why? White privilege. Yeah. Who participates in ballets? All these white, rich people. You know? It's, it's insane, isn't it? It's the devil just constantly dividing us, dividing us, dividing us. Now, hmm. we're very close to World War III. You know this, right? You understand this? Who doesn't, understand, who doesn't realize we're very close to World War III? Probably most of you don't realize how close we are. What did the United States do very recently that has poked the bear in the eye once again? We, we, no, 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 no. What? No, no, they don't care about that either. Yes, that's what we did. We just shipped several long range missile batteries to Ukraine. As quickly as they're getting them established, Russia's blowing them up. Now, Zelensky said he's going to use these to attack the Russian fleet in the Black Sea, and he's also going to attack Crimea. Crimea, there's a large military, Russian military base there in Crimea. He's going to attack Crimea. Russia said, if you do that, you're not going to be able to imagine the consequences that you're going to suffer. And they don't, they're not, you know, they, when they threaten, they're not blowing smoke. It's not like they draw a red line and then draw another one, another one, another one, okay? So... <clears throat> What, um, and I told you, in this, in this battle between the Ukraine and the Russians, are there any good guys? No. no. The only good guys that are really suffering is the church in Ukraine, the true body of Christ, OK? Now, all of this was so unnecessary. That's right. Who started this war? Who started this war, this conflict between the Ukrainians and the Russians? Obama. Obama the Obama administration. What did they do? Now, listen, they violated an agreement that the United... I'm giving you some geopolitical uh, information here. What? Okay. Yeah, they violated an agreement that, that the West had with Russia that NATO would never move any farther east than where they were. And Russia was happy with that agreement, and the West, for a long time, were happy with that agreement. The Democrats have to create conflict, war, why? Because they went in there, you know, don't let any, any crisis go to waste or any chaos that they bring about, because then they bring about the solution, right? Who's taking credit for the gas prices coming down now? The very guy who caused it. <laughs> insane. And he thinks we're all so stupid. But anyway, what happened was Obama 
started to woo Ukraine and under the false pretense that he was going to allow them to come into NATO. That immediately perked up Russia. Russia. Their antenna went up, right? And they said, no, you're not going to do that. No, you're not going to do that. Well, the more Obama tried to woo and the Ukrainians were accepting these uh, ad you know, advances, or whatever you want to call it, uh, Putin finally said, enough is enough, and he took you in Crimea in 2014. What do we do about it? Nothing. nothing, nothing. But that was a warning. He said, now look, I've warned you. I've taken Crimea. Now I've established this base. I've got this, this uh, military naval base there right in the Black Sea. Don't go any further. I'm telling you, I'm not going to allow Ukraine to become a member of NATO. It's going to remain in neutrality, as we agreed. Trump comes to office. What does Trump do? Trump immediately starts to keep the agreements we made. He doesn't try to woo Ukraine and make Ukraine part of NATO. As a matter of fact, he starts to realize that, that what we need to do is get Russia to understand that we, Russia and the United States, have a common enemy in Red China. So he starts to try to make advances where he can, we can develop a friendly relationship with the Russians. The majority of the Russian population are what by religious persuasion? <coughs> Greek Orthodox, I mean, they're Russian Orthodox, they're Christians. They're Christians. George W. Bush, after visiting Vladimir Putin, what did he come home and say? He's a Christian. He's my brother. <laughs> Funny way of measuring those things. But anyway, nonetheless, Trump was, was very right and very smart in trying to develop a good relationship with the Russians so that we could work together to counter the Chinese threat. What did the liberals here and the elitists do? Right? Their heads exploded. Russia, 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 Russia. Trump's a traitor, Trump's a traitor. And they, they made up all of these lies and these false scenarios, and, and, and then they stole the election. And what does Biden do as soon as he gets in office? Starts to poke the bear in the eye again. They start wooing Ukraine. And this, and this comedian, who's the comedian? Zelensky. Zelensky's a comedian. And, the, and the, right now, the joke is on Zelensky. I want you to understand that. The joke is on Zelensky and his country because the West decided we'll sacrifice that country for our ends, our wicked and evil ends of global domination, right? And so Biden comes along, and he starts making advances towards Ukraine, bringing them in as becoming a part of NATO. And Putin said, no, you're not going to do that. And, and the only thing that was necessary, the only thing the West and Zelensky had to do was establish some legislation that said they will maintain their neutrality and never become a part of NATO. And what would Putin have done? He would have walked away. Instead, he amassed an army of, what, 200,000, 250,000 troops on the border and said, look, I'm not going to let you do this. I'm not going to let you do this. Now, it'd be no different than if... if uh, Russia was trying to establish some military, offensive military operations in Cuba. Well, as a matter of fact, they tried, they tried to do that one time, didn't they? <laughs> what do we call that? The Bay of what? Pigs. The Bay of Pigs. And we wouldn't let it happen. We were, we were willing, willing to go to nuclear war yeah. to stop it. I'm sorry? Oh, but we were safe under our school death. <laughs> <laughs> did you see, the, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you see the public service announcement that yeah. took place in New York City? Yeah. In case of nuclear war, yeah. go in your house, stay home, close the windows. You know? <laughs> you, know, you know why they tell you to get under your desk and put your head between your legs? Won't be a desk. So you can kiss your butt goodbye. This is terrible. And we record these things, don't we? <laughs> So all, all that would have been necessary is for Ukraine to maintain their neutrality, to, to put forth a legislation that would ensure and guarantee that the previous agreements and arrangements that were made with the West and Russia would, would still stand. We never had any intention of letting Ukraine into NATO. Can't, we don't trust that nation. They're, they're, they're so corrupt, terribly corrupt, right? But we were playing a game. And who are the real losers? Yeah, the Ukrainian people, the real losers of the Ukrainian, their cities are being destroyed. They're, they're, Russia is smashing them to pieces. But listen, in spite of what you're hearing on the, on the NBC, CNN, MSNBC, Ukraine has not won any offensive against Russia, period. Every 
every military campaign or conflict has been defensive on their part, offensive on the part of the Russians. The Russians are going to win this. Make no mistake about that. So why is Zelensky willing to sacrifice his entire country? Money. He's bought into this ideology, this, idol, this elitist dream of this utopia that will never exist. Why, 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 why does God let it go to the very end just before we completely destroy every life on the planet before Jesus intervenes? The second coming, why? That's right. Because that's what they believe. They believe they're going to create a world that's perfect, a paradise on this earth that they control. And they're willing to sacrifice the Ukrainians. And they're willing, listen to me, they're willing to sacrifice middle America and working Canada and working men and women of Europe to establish their goals. As a matter of fact, there's too many of you on the planet anyway. And most of you are worse, worse useful, or worthless, excuse me, useless eaters, as Hitler would say, right? So I, I say all of this to say, this is where we are. Now, should you be scared? No. no. Papa told us all of this. Isn't it? It's just amazing. I'm just so thrilled because he told me all of this. And he said, when, when, my son, when you begin to see all of this take place, all of this begin to form, look to the eastern sky for your Egyptian. Oh, no. We read that verse in Hebrews last week, 928. And what did it say? He, he's coming again a second time, but not for sin, but for Salvation for a rescue for those who what? Are eagerly waiting for him. Yeah. Now that's where my hope is. I, my hope is not anywhere else. Now, when we talk about the financial situation, you know, China controlling through surveillance, finances, disarming the people, and the scoring system, they're coming after our finances. Make no mistake about it. As easily as it was for Canada to pass legislation to steal those truckers' finances and freeze their assets, do you think they, they can't do the same thing here? They can do it overnight. So what are you going to put your trust in? Put your trust in the Lord. Now, we'll work together. We're going to pray. We're going to do everything we can. We're going to vote the right way. Okay? Um, but I believe that God said all of this was going to take place. And so from my perspective, it's inevitable. Now, I think there's a good chance we're going to slaughter them in the midterm elections. But it'll be a short reprieve. Didn't I say that about the Trump election when Trump was elected? I said, look, don't, don't make it misunderstanding. This is just a short reprieve. God is going to allow all of these things to take place because the majority of the world is in opposition to him. Even, even all of these pro-national, uh, revive America program, all these people that are gathering together, they, they want prosperity, they want safe borders, they want uh, safe streets, but they don't want Jesus. They don't want God and his law, his, his word ruling over their hearts and their lives. You know. Somebody said, even uh, was it in Ukraine that they're voting on same-sex uh, marriage? Where is it? What did you say? Yeah. Yeah, 28,000 people signed a petition for same-sex marriage. The whole world is insane. But we know that one or two forces are inspiring and driving every individual on the planet. Is that, now listen, is anyone ever really truly free? You know, we talk about we want to be free. I want to be free, free to make my own decisions, free of this, free of that. Is anyone ever free? No. Never. You're never free. You're either controlled by one or the other, either by light or darkness, either by God or Hasatan, either by the world and your flesh or the spirit in his, in his word. Amen? And that's what you need to understand. Now, I choose to be a slave to the word and a slave to God and not a slave to my flesh or this world or Satan. Amen? Amen. Many, 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 many out of fear are going to cave. Look, look at the fear they put into our population with the COVID. And listen, we're now, now what, are they, what are they beating the drum about? Monkeypox, monkeypox, monkeypox. <laughs> you know, and all the homosexuals are up in arms, right? Because they haven't done something soon enough. Why? 
Mm, we know why. It's being recorded. <laughs> David's message was so right on on Sunday. If you, listen, if, if, go back and listen to it again. I was so encouraged and my heart was so strengthened. Jesus set the example for us. We sang it this evening in Terry's song. He is enough. He will sustain us. If we suffer the loss of everything in this life, what have we lost? nothing because we've gained Christ and we are rich beyond measure Paul said I have suffered the loss of all things for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus for whom I have suffered these things now I, I hope I'm wrong I hope it doesn't get as dark as I think it might get you know I hope we don't see it but if we do be encouraged beloved and, and don't hold contempt for God Hold contempt for the enemy and, and try to open up the eyes of so many who are so ignorant of what's taking place. God is judging America. God is judging Europe. God is judging. Why? Because we no longer represent him. That fellow I tried to witness to two days. I mean, I can't imagine being shot five times, lost his leg. I showed, he's showing me all the exit wounds and entrance wounds. And, and then I, I read his story in this book and I couldn't believe it. And, and how could you not? How could you not be drawn close to Christ your Savior? After all that. But there'll be many in our society who will not. And they'll have contempt for God over it. Just don't let them be you. And we can be a voice of compassion and mercy and reason. Explaining to them. It's not about life here. No matter what the cost, it's living for Jesus at all costs, right? Mm. So back to the warnings. Okay, so we're looking at uh, some of the models or types in the Old Testament, if you remember. Uh, we looked at Noah, and we looked at Enoch, and we looked at uh, Elijah and Elisha. We looked at Daniel and his three compadres, right? And then we started to look at some of the warnings that are in the New Testament. That you, you know, and the warnings are to believers, not to unbelievers, that we need to be ready. I think there's a lot of people sleeping in a stupor spiritually who are not ready. Like this, this man, John, grew up in the church, reads his Bible every day, but he's still, he's not sure of the gospel. And I, and I pleaded with him. I said, John, it's all true. John, John, read the gospel of John. 21 chapters, 21 days, you'll have a, a, an experience with the Holy Spirit like never before. John wrote that to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is God. He said, no, he's the son of God. No, Jesus is God. You know, and, but there's so much confusion out there, isn't there? Isn't there? But we need to let our lives be used now to bring that light of the truth. Our weapons are not carnal. No. Mighty through God. Here, go back to Mark. Now, we said the apocalyptic, the apocalyptic literature in the Gospels were where? You remember? Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Speaking of the apocalypse, what does the apocalypse mean? The unveiling. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It's the return of Christ. It, the revelation. The revelation is the apocalypse. The unveiling of Christ. The coming of Christ in all his glory. That's what we're all waiting for, isn't it? All right, so go to Mark 13. You want to look at the exhortation there. In verse 28, he begins that parable we talked about last week. What was that? The fig tree, the parable of the fig tree. And boy, wasn't that exciting when we look at all of the dates and the times and, and we're here, we're here. You know, the one, the one nation is not playing into all of this is Israel. And they're be betwixt and between because they're, they're not spiritually awakened yet, but they haven't fall prey completely to all this ideology, this craziness. God's going to awaken them. Hmm? But they've been awakened physically to the land. God's going to awaken them next spiritually. But I want to, for our conversation tonight in this exhortation to watch, look at verse 32. But of that day... In hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. What day? The day of the rapture. Now, now, we know the day of the second coming. There's no doubt about that. We know exactly when Jesus Christ is coming to step foot on the Mount of Olives, don't we? When is that day? What you said? 
1,290 days after, after this man of sin, after the son of perdition, after the Antichrist, stands in the rebuilt temple into the Holy of Holies and proclaims himself to be the God of all gods, that the whole world needs to bow down and worship him, right? From that moment on, when he does that, there's only 1,290 days and Christ will be here. So we know exactly when he's coming, the second coming. But we said the second coming is in two phases. The first phase, he comes for the church. Second time, he comes with the church. So that's what he's speaking about here. That first phase, when he comes for the church. Don't you want to go in that first phase? Yeah. I do. So that's the warning here. But of that there, oh, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor my father only, nor, nor the son. Now, now, Jesus didn't know that day when he was on earth. Why is that? Why wouldn't Jesus know that day? I'm sorry? Okay, what else? Any other reason? I was, I was explaining to this man today, look, I'm not talking about religion. I, I, I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. I'm talking about spirituality. I'm talking about having a personal relationship with my, God, my creator, through the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who's my Lord and Savior, right? In my heart, not in my head, right? I, I have to believe in my heart, head and my heart, don't I? A lot of people have it in their head, but nothing in the heart. So they're not surrendered. John eleven twenty six 26 says, if you live in and believe in Jesus. So it's got to be both, head and the heart, right? Now, Jesus is indicating here that we need to draw closer to him than ever before to live in the Lord. And when we're in the Lord, he, reveal, he the Holy Spirit, through the word, reveals these things to us, and it becomes so clear, as clear as day, doesn't it? You read it, it's wow, wow, wow. You know, like you said, the same, oh, that's why, that's why these, yes, of course, that makes all the sense in the world now. They're, they're competing for global domination, right? All right, so he says here, take heed, take heed. Why didn't Jesus know? That's where I was. Why didn't Jesus know? When he was here on earth, what was he representing? When we talk about this, this intimate relationship, a relation of intimacy, we touched on it last week, where it's the relationship that a man has with his wife that the bride has with the... Now, now that's the, listen, that's what he's working out here. And if you know something about a Jewish wedding custom, particularly in Jesus' day, this is all playing out. Why wouldn't the son know? Because only the father. The father determines the bride, right? And the father determines when the bridegroom goes to get his bride. Because the, the bridegroom, what does he have to do after this betrothal period? And they, they enter into this betrothal, and the betrothal is a contract of marriage, and everything happens within that relationship except a physical consummation of the relationship. That doesn't happen until they get under the chupa, right? But, but what does the bridegroom go to do during this time? Prepare a place, prepare a place for her. And what does she do? Wait. Prepare, prepare her, wait and prepare herself for that day. For that day, Right? Wait on the Lord, and you shall renew your strength. There's so many scriptures that talk about us waiting patiently for the Lord, right? And so that, the only reason why Jesus didn't on earth know that day or that hour is because it was up to the Father. There's coming a day when the Father's going to say to the Son, Son, descend and receive your bride and bring her home to be with us, right? And so the bridegroom, he would go, and he might, uh, if they weren't really well off financially, he'd decorate his room, maybe paint up the room, put some color in there, you know, make it attractive for her. If they were a little better off, he might add to the home place, you know, you had another room on that. Or if he's really doing well, he'd create his own place, you know, and move away with his bride and his babies. <laughs> you know, we always hate when our kids do that, but that's the best thing for them, you know, mature their relationship, and their oneness. But anyway, another matter. <laughs> Jesus, now, knows the hour. Just as when he was here, he kept saying, my hour's not come, my hour's not come, my hour's not come. How many times did we read that in John? And then, and then finally he says, the hour's come. The hour's come. Now, he's warning us to beware of that hour. Look. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is coming. It is like a man going into a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants to teach one his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming in the evening or at midnight at the crowing of the rooster or in the morning. Least coming suddenly, you find, he, he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. watch. Now, 
This word watch in the Greek text, both here and in Luke's gospel, means to sleep with one eye open. You know? That, that's, you got to be watching. I joke around. My, my bride says, well, why do you, why do you, why do you, I don't know. No, I don't want to talk about it now. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing about the bride, but, you know. <clears throat> I, I, I can defend myself if I need to. And she says, well, why do you need to die? I says, you know, I don't know. You know, I've, I, I've had a, a license to do this since I was in my 20s. And I said, you know, you know how long I've been waiting for this guy to show up? You know, I just wish he could show up so I could get this over with. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> but what a hero that young man was in that mall in Indiana, wasn't he? <sighs> within, within less than a minute of the initial attack beginning, phew, gone, over with. Wow, praise God. 20 minutes from where I grew up. Is that right? Mm. Yeah. Can happen anywhere. But what's the word here? Watch. 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 Go to Luke chapter 12. Who's he speaking to? Church. You and I. Jesus is speaking to you and I about being watchful. Chapter 12. Luke. Verse 35, you have a heading? You must be ready. The expectant servant. Verse 35, chapter 12 of Luke. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Why do you gird your waist? Work. What else do you gird your waist for? War. Work and war. If you're going to war or if you're going to work, you gird yourself. So you have freedom of movement. You can run. You can move quickly. Let your waist be girded and your lamp burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, you may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom, when the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. Wow. What, 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 what is that event? Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Can you imagine that? I mean, you know, we're going to get to heaven. He's going to seat us at this banqueting table, and he himself is going to serve us. It'll be like what happened in John 13. What happened in John 13? He washed all their feet. What a humbling thing that must have been. Yeah, that's a, that's a big triclinic. I'm going to be... Mm. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you, he will gird himself. He will have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Now, we may not know the exact hour, but we should know and be aware of the season of his return. That very, very, very soon we're approaching that day. Do you believe that? My study of Bible prophecy and eschatology, I mean, the, 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 the plurality of signs, plural, of the time singular that we're in. It's amazing. And, and just some of the geopolitical intrigue that we talked about tonight. Wow, doesn't it amaze you? I mean, you know, I think, David, didn't you in your message on Sunday say you, you couldn't believe how fast things have been changing? I mean, it's just so incredibly fast. You, you, It'll take our breath away when we see some changes that are going to take place in the very near future and how quickly they're going to take place. Hmm? Yes, I, you know, I never had that experience. You know, but I'm sure some of you ladies can tell us about that, right? As, as that day comes, the pains get closer in frequency and then more intense in the pain as faith pains upon a pregnant woman. Look at me at Luke 21 now. That's that apocalyptic chapter. Luke 21. Chapter 21 of Luke's Gospel. Now 
Now, in, in uh, beginning in verse 29, he talks again, again, the third time now, the parable of the fig tree. Think he wants you to get that down? <laughs> that this is a very, very important sign. Israel has always been an important sign. It began there, it's all going to end there, right? With the nation of Israel. God measures all of human history by the way in which he's dealing with the Jewish people, with Israel. The, the 69 sevens have passed. One, one seven-year period is left. And that will be the end of the age. The end of this world as we know it, right? But look at verse 34. The warning. But take heed to who? Your wife? Your kids? Your husband? Your neighbor? Yourself. Listen. 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 At the end of the day, the only, listen, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what else happens, what anybody else does. The only thing that matters is your relationship with Jesus. I don't care what you may be suffering. I don't care what you may be going through. If you're drawing close to Jesus, you're going to be okay. And I don't know how many times I've told this to people, people who are in very difficult situations, people where their, their, their husbands have walked away or their wives have walked away. Or, and, I, and I tell them, look, it, it, uh, yeah, we're going to pray. We're going to hope that the Lord will restore. But in the fact that he does not, if he doesn't answer your prayers the way you would like him to, I guarantee you this, 100% guarantee you draw close to Jesus and you won't have anything to worry about. You're going to be okay. If you don't, you need to be concerned. Because as David pointed out in his message on Sunday, there'll be a lot of people who are being suffering the testings that are coming upon this world, and they're going to have contempt for God. If this is love, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. How foolish is that? How foolish is that? Why is there all this suffering in this world? As I tried to explain to that man today, you know, why the bloodshed? Why the war? What? Sin. Sin. And where's that Sin. Most prevalent, where, where should we be concerned about that sin more than any place else? Take heed to yourself. I pray all the time, Lord Jesus, please change me. Change me. From the very core of who I am, change me, Lord. Make me more like you. And may my son and my daughter and my wife and my dog <laughs> and my church see it more than any, anyone else, the change that should occur in me. I become more and more like you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing. Now, nobody has to worry about that here, I don't think, no. But boy, it's sure a problem in the contemporary church, isn't it? Carousing. Oh, man. Carousing, drunkenness. Okay, there were no drunkards here. I don't, no, 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 no. How about the cares of this life? Boy, that can get all of us, can it? Yeah, right. Come on. We, we can get so overwhelmed with the cares of this world. You know, I have to be careful about all of the, the information I take in about what's going on geopolitically because I, I can, my, my mind and, and my mood can go in the wrong way, so I have to stop, I have to shut it off, and I have to get into the good news and be built up again. Then, then I can go back out there and take a little bit more of that, you know. I don't want to get totally beaten down, right? But I want to be informed. I want to be aware. I want to be as, harm, as, as wise as a serpent, but as harmless as a dove. Not like the opposition, who are as harmful as the serpent, and as wise as the same. But do not let that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. The whole world is going to fall sway to the evil one. And what's happening? Now, there, there's the great deception coming. And, and these world leaders and these governments and these elitists don't even realize how much they're being deceived right now. Oh, what's about to be exposed to the world? Aliens. <laughs> Listen, you laugh. It's true. It's true. You know, NASA hires all these religious leaders to prepare their, prepare their devotees for the contact with aliens, how they're going to process aliens with regard to their religious beliefs. But we know exactly what all of this is, don't we? Some of these, some of these programs that have, um, what's this one program? Uh, the, the most, uh, the area in the country where there's more paranormal activity than any place else. What is it? Huh? No, 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 no. Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah, upstate New York, yeah. Anybody want to see the Skinwalker Ranch? Don't bother. 
but it's all, it's all demonic, and it's demonic deception. And they hire all of the physicists and scientists and, 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 and wow, to try to study this paranormal activity. Read the Bible. You know, nothing's new. Hey, don't you think there's a correlation? Just before the first coming of Jesus Christ, when his, he established his ministry at 30 years of age, what was taking place spiritually? Demonic activity was rampant everywhere. If you go back to the Old Testament, you'll see a little bit here and there. Daniel talks about it, you know, the prince of Persia, you know, restraining, you know. But, but there's not much of it at all, really, in the Old Testament. You get into that intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament and the coming of Christ. <sighs> what is going on? It explodes with demonic activity. When Jesus is on the scene with his disciples, they're casting demons out of everybody all the time, aren't they? To read the text. Now, what's happened since? He ascended, and what happened? Pfft, died right down. What is happening currently? Wow. The demon demonic activity on the globe is, is increasing to a crescendo just before the second coming, just as it was at the first coming of Christ. It's amazing, isn't it? The enemy doesn't have an original thought. Just, I mean, it's just... And so we can see these patterns that work themselves out. And so one of, one, and then again, one of the many signs of the return of Jesus Christ is all of this increase in spiritual and demonic activity and the demonic deception that's taking place with these UFOs. Now, how is it they can defy physics? How is it they can travel the way they do? How is it that they're just points of light? And what did Paul tell us in Corinthians? That Satan would disguise himself as an angel of light, right? It's amazing, amazing. Read the Bible, and the answers are there. Watch, therefore, and pray always. Watch, sleep with wide open, pray. This word pray in the Greek text means you're begging God. What am I begging God for? Pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Wait a minute. If... It's all a guarantee for everyone who believes. Why do I need to stay up watching and praying? But wait a minute, well, you know, why, why do I have to worry about it, Ed? I'm in the Lord. Hey, let's eat, drink, and be merry. You know, come on. You know, it's, it's okay. You know, hey, when he comes, we're going, right? No? You sure? Why? Now listen, here, here, the, the West has been deceived in believing that the rapture of the church is synonymous with salvation, the one and the same. No, 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 no. Every Christian is saved. Everyone who possesses the Holy Spirit is saved. But what we've been seeing in the text, and we'll continue to see next week as we continue our study, is that, that like Enoch and Noah, like Elijah and Elisha, like Daniel and his three compadres, right, there was a difference in their dedication and their walk with the Lord, in their response to the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. What did God say? He gave Enoch because he pleased the Lord? A reward. A reward. Paul's going to talk about the same thing when we get into Philippians. That, that he presses on. He's pressing on for the upward call of God. And, he's, and contextually, when you read the text, when I take you in there, you're going to see he's talking about the rapture of the church. And he said it is a reward. The word he uses in the Greek text is a reward as in the Olympic Games, where you ran and you participated according to the rules and you won a reward. Now, all Christians are saved. But there are a lot of Christians who are going to go through tribulation. How do I know that? Because the Bible says so. There is a myriad of tribulation saints. And they're from every tribe, nation, people, and tongue. This is after the fullness of the Gentiles. This is after the church age is over. Where'd they come from? They went into the tribulation of those days as Noah and his three sons and their wives went into the tribulation of those days. As the three Hebrew children went into the tribulation of fires that Nebuchadnezzar. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I hope I'm wrong. I do. I hope I'm completely wrong and, and that these warnings that Jesus is giving don't mean anything. Do you think that's possible? No, of course it's not. Jesus doesn't give a warning that doesn't have some teeth to it. Or the what else, right? 
And so he's warning, not his disciples. These warnings, and I'll continue them next week, are for you and I. Now, he's encouraging us strongly to get our lives right with him, to draw close to him so that we can be protected under the wings of the Almighty. So that when that day comes, we don't have to fret. Why? Because he's coming again a second, and not for sin, but for salvation for those who eagerly wait for him. Some people are so caught up in all their stuff of this world or other pleasures and pursuits or relationships more than him, and they're just not ready. And they, they would, how many times have you talked to somebody about the second coming of Christ and they say, yeah, 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 but just not now. Not now. They're not eagerly waiting for him. Are they? No. Now, if I'm wrong and everybody goes, well, praise the Lord. You got nothing to worry about, right? If I'm right, and I know it's not of you, but if you're a person who's playing fast and loose with your salvation, you got to be concerned. I don't want to be here then. It's, it's, wow. Somebody said, I'm so glad you're feeling better. I said, I wish I had the plague. I'd rather go home. <laughs> you know, let's all get the plague and get out of here. You know, I mean, is there any other place you'd rather be? I know, after the 30th. Okay. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Questions, comments? So if I'm wrong, praise the Lord, and you're drawing as close as you can to the Lord, you've got nothing to worry about. If I'm right, and you're a hypocrite, right, then you've got every reason to be concerned. And as I pointed out from the geopolitical situation of the world today, more, we're closer to World War III than we have ever been. Believe me. And that's where we're headed. What did we learn from history? We learned nothing from history. Yeah. Shall we stand?